biomarkers. And I think something that a lot of rare disease groups talk about is identification of biomarkers. And we have been lucky enough in the DuPTQ area to have some biomarkers that have been, have been found in the EEG. And so we're gonna have some presentations today about those, those biomarkers. And so we have um, a couple of people joining us from actually from um, France. And then uh, one of our former postdocs that we supported who is at UCLA, um, Dr. Vidya Saravana Pandian, with Dr. Um, Monica Eisterman, and Dr. Marie Therese Dangles. Um, and so we'll, we will turn it over to them. Just waiting for the virtual part. And I completely messed up the French names. Usually you can reintroduce yourselves with your amazing accents because I'm so bad at them. Right, so good evening, at least in Paris, it's evening. So good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation. I'm very lucky, very um, happy. And thank you to the organizer that uh, we have the possibility to present you our recent work. And it's a great pleasure to be with you and to meet uh, uh, one of the, the, the famous uh, teams uh, that worked for a long time on these uh, biomarkers. So very nice to meet you. And so um, my name is uh, Monica Eisenman. I'm a, um, a pediatrician and clinical neurophysiologist. So um, mainly working, uh, uh, doing a clinical work. And uh, my colleague, my fellow, she, she uh, apologized. She is not able to join us uh, at this time. Uh, and as Marie-Thérèse uh, Ndangle, a, um, well, she is also she is pediatric neurologist and uh, works in clinical neuro neurophysiology as well. So, thank you very much again. And she had pre registered pre uh, recorded uh, the presentation um, on the on our on our work. So, I don't know if. Uh, um, so essentially, our work is uh, is a retrospective work on a patient we follow in our hospital and is based on uh, epileptic uh, patients with uh, um, uh, chromosome 15 uh, duplication syndrome. And uh, so we will present you in the following presentation our results. Hello, everyone. I am awesome. Hi, uh, Monica. And hi, Vanessa. And hi, everyone. Um, really great to be here. Um, I'm really excited for the talks. I'm actually um, connecting from Los Angeles. So I am a postdoctoral fellow in UCLA. Um, I did my PhD with Dr. Shafali Juste, um, who you all uh, may have heard speak earlier at the neurology panel. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to present some of our work um, in investigating sleep physiology in children with 215Q syndrome and um, some of the findings that is um, really exciting and interesting um, and really like allowing us to uh, move forward to with, um, you know, large scale studies across genetic syndromes. And so really excited um, to be in this um, setup across, you know, different genetic disorders and also families. Um, so yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I'll let Vanessa um, tell like in which order we're supposed to go. Are you going to do the pre-recorded first? Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Dong. I am very thankful to be able to talk to you about my work, electroclinical features in the epileptic children with chromosome 15 long arm is characterized by five recurrent breakpoints or uh, chromosomal rearrangements. Between BP2 and BP3 stands the Prado Weavy of the Angelman critical region or PWACR, in which we can find a cluster of genes for GABA aminobutyric um, type A receptor genes. 
uh, it is well known now that deletions of um, the PWACR, if paternally derived, uh, will lead to Prado Willi syndrome, whereas maternally derived deletions will lead to Angelman syndrome. On the other hand, um, duplications, um, when paternally derived, can um, lead to variable phenotypes, and uh, maternally derived duplications will lead to that 15 q phenotype. So if we look more closely on, on the genetics of that 15 q we can see that two kind of uh, duplications exist. Here we've got a normal um, chromosome 15 q um, that is to say long arm of uh, chromosome 15 with its centromere here. This is the maternally inherited chromosome. This is the paternally inherited chromosome. So we've got two copies of uh, the PWACR. In interstitial duplications, we've got one extra copy which uh, happens inside the, the maternally inherited chromosome. In IDIC15 um, duplication, which is isodicentric, we've got one supernumerary marker uh, of chromosome 15. That is to say that we've got our two normal um, chromosomes, the one which is maternally inherited, the one which is paternally inherited. And we've got those two extra copies of uh, the PWACR that ligate end to end as a supernumerary marker. Um, this can be either symmetrical or asymmetrical. And uh, these are the different types of duplication 15Q. They both lead to at least one extra maternally derived copy of the PWACR. It has been reported in literature that um, epilepsy can happen about in about 25% of the patients with INTOP15 and in about 65% of the patients in IDIC15. Um, epilepsy is of early onset and often treatment refractory with more pejorative course in IDIC15 patients. EEGs uh, show an excessive beta activity during wake in the 15 q patients in comparison to autistic age and IQ matched children and to healthy typically developing age matched children. So considering this, um, the aim of our work was to try to describe the evolution of seizure types and epilepsy according to age in children, as well as um, describing EEG patterns according to vigilance states and age in children. Therefore, we did this monocentric retrospective study at Necker Enfant Malade Hospital in which we, in which we included patients followed from 2007 to 2019. Um, the in inclusion criteria for an actual DUP15Q diagnosis uh, in the cytogenetics department and um, EEGs available in the hospital database. We reviewed clinical data of each patient regarding pregnancy, birth, development, behavior, autistic spectrum disorder, age at seizure onset, seizure types or seizure semiology, epilepsy syndrome when applicable, and anti-seizure medication. We also reviewed their video EEGs, um, that is to say electroencephalograms, and we looked at their background in wake and sleep, um, about interictal features, ictal features, and we also did some power spectrum analysis over 10 sensors uh, on the right and on the left hemispheres. So we included 12 patients, 5 int 15 and 7 IDIC15 patients. There were 8 males and 4 females, and uh, all of them had either trisomy or tetrasomy of the PWACR region. 
regarding clinical data, we had a medium follow-up duration um, of eight years and three months. Age at last clinical follow-up was uh, around 13 years old in, in the 15 group, whereas it was younger, around seven years old in IDIC 15 group. In both groups, clinical history showed unrelated parents, normal pregnancy course, uneventful delivery, fixed psychomotor delay, and autistic features in all children. Unfortunately, epilepsy was of early onset, uh, with a median onset at nine months old in INDAP 15 group and eight months old in IDIC 15 group. Children in INDAP 15 group showed epileptic spasms, tonic seizures, myoclonic seizures, atypical absences, um, more often focal seizures, and uh, some generalized tonic clonic seizures. Three children had focal epilepsy, one uh, presented with West syndrome, and one actually had West syndrome evolving towards Lennox Gastaut syndrome. This is, to our knowledge, uh, a novel observation because um, in top 15 evolving towards Lennox Gastaut syndrome has never been reported in literature to our knowledge. Four out of five in top 15 patients were seizure free and one was drug resistant with Lennox Gastaut syndrome. In IDIC 15 group, um, patients presented with epileptic spasms, tonic seizures, myoclonic seizures, atypical absences, uh, less had focal seizures, and four out of seven had generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Three children actually had West syndrome. One uh, had West syndrome e later evolving towards Lennox Gastaut syndrome. Uh, two children had de novo Lennox Gastaut syndrome, and one child had uh, unclass unclassifiable epileptic encephalopathy. Only two out of seven were seizure free at time at the time of uh, last clinical follow up and uh, five of them were uh, drug resistant. Regarding EEG and ictal features, I will show you uh, a pattern which was highly similar between four of the IDIC 15 patients that had West syndrome. So this uh, seven month old girl shows brief tonic seizures that happen in clusters just as epileptic spasms, but they're not epileptic spasms. They are um, very brief tonic contractions and they are concomitant with um, these bursts of spikes and polyspikes that are diffuse with an occipital predominance. Uh, we can see that this little girl is sleeping. Um, we can see some sleep spindles uh, on the vertex. And as you can see, these last about three seconds, one to three seconds, and it eventually wakes the um, patient. So the EEGs were highly similar in four of uh, the IDIC 15 patients, um, showing these diffuse with posterior pre predominance uh, polyspike bursts, um, either ictal with brief tonic contraction of the upper limbs or interictal with no motor uh, manifestation asso associated. Regarding EEG intrictal features, we found a peculiar aspect of atypical hypsarrhythmia in four out of six patients with West syndrome. Indeed, compared to typical hypsarrhythmia on the right side of the screen, 
we've got uh, where we've got during wake this very disorganized tracing with multifocal spikes and on the bottom line um, this fragmentation during sleep well in our children we found um, atypical hypsorrhythmia um, in which amplitude increase was moderate allowing interpretation at usual sensitivity although we could still see uh, multifocal spikes and uh, fragmentation during sleep all children had intractal paroxysmal activities with generalized or multifocal spikes spike and waves and polyspikes Regarding EEG background, we had a total of 70 EEGs to analyze with 1 to 16 EEGs per patient with a median of 6 EEGs per patient. Median follow-up was of 4 years and 2 months. We had 25 EEGs in INDOP15 group and 45 EEGs in ITIC15 group. EEGs were performed at a median younger age in ITIC 15 group compared to in top 15 group. So EEG background is very interesting because we can see this diffuse uh, beta rapid rhythms uh, with occipital predominance during wake on the upper left EEG tracing whereas those rapid rhythm tend to decrease during sleep uh, in the lower left EEG tracing, where we can also see sleep spindles showing that the child is actually sleeping. On the right side of the screen, we can see density spectral array that plots frequency power uh, from 1 hertz to um, 48 hertz during time and vigilance states. So over a 2.5 hours recording, we can see that diffuse rapid rhythms at 20 Hertz um, occur in wakefulness with occipital predominance. Um, we can see here on the with the red arrows uh, over O1 and O2 leads, which are occipital. They're present during wakefulness, they decrease in frequency and power in non-REM sleep, and they reappear at awakening. Besides, uh, background EEGs showed that there was anterior-posterior uh, spatial organization in 9 out of 12 patients, although remaining slow in 3 out of 9 patients, and 11 out of 12 patients showed beta band rapid rhythms with diffuse and um, occipital predominance localization. In sleep, we could see physiological figures in, out, in 8 out of 12 patients. In order to evaluate the behavior of EEG oscillations, we used fast Fourier transform in order to analyze and map power spectrum density. As ages at EEG were not equally distributed among the whole population of patients, uh, we described four age groups, uh, one before one year old, one which was one to two years old, um, one group between two and six years old, and one group over six years old. This was in order to assess EEG maturation and to allow a maximum number of participants in each group. In order to avoid, to avoid a weighting bias, since all patients had um, different numbers of EEGs performed, we selected one EEG per patient and per age group with the best quality and containing as many vigilant states as possible. We then compared the power spectrum between wake and sleep states um, in each group and note that none of the selected EEGs was of patients under benzodiazepine, uh, which are known to increase beta oscillations. So here we can see power spectral density in decibels during wake in red and sleep in blue. So we noted an increase of power in the beta 
uh, and gamma bands. Beta is between 13 and 30 hertz, and gamma is between 30 and 48 hertz uh, during wakefulness. So this is shown by the red bumps. Um, and they are indicated with a vertical black line. So in all age groups, we noted an increase of power in the beta band during wake states when compared to sleep. Uh, mean beta peak frequency tended to increase with aging during wakefulness from 17 hertz to about 27 hertz. Then we plotted the difference of power between wake and sleep for each sensor across frequency. Blue lines represent anterior leads. Purple represent central leads. And fuchsia represents posterior leads. Dashed lines and plane lines indicate significant thresholds. So note the appearance of significant diffuse beta band activity after one year old, later switching to an anterior localization. In group um, less than one year old, we can see that this difference did not reach significance after Bonferroni correction. The topography of beta power activity during wake compared to sleep appeared to be diffuse in the group one to two years old and with frontal temporal predominance in the group two to six years old and more localized on frontal electrodes in the group over six years old. It is very interesting to see that rapid rhythms have already been reported in the 15Q condition. Beta power in awake state was reported as being significantly higher in the 15 q syndrome and proposed as a biomarker in formal literature. In our study, we showed that these rapid rhythm actually significantly diminished in the 15 q sleep and that their localization uh, shifted from diffuse to more interior with age. One question we may ask is the link between beta rhythms in the 15 q and GABAergic activity due to copy number gain of GABA-A receptor genes. Several indicators uh, are pointing towards uh, GABA-A receptor modulation resulting from duplication 15 q First of all, the gene cluster localization we saw that uh, GABA-A receptor genes are localized within the PWACR, which is um, duplicated in the 15 q Also, we know that rapid rhythms mimic GABA-A receptor agonists' fast activity, such as benzodiazepines, and finally, poor response of West syndrome to GABA-A receptor agonists, such as the gabapentin or benzodiazepine has been reported in literature. So all of these clues point towards a link between beta rhythms in dot 15 q and GABAergic activity due to copy number gain of GABA-A receptors. To sum up, in our series of 12 patients, Wester lennox gastos syndrome often occurred in isodecentric duplication 15 q whereas focal epilepsy often occurred in interstitial duplication 15Q. Temporospatial organization of beta oscillations on EEG could be of significant help in directing towards the uh, 15 q diagnosis in epileptic children. And if you are interested in more details, you can reach our article in the Clinical Neurophysiology um, of March 2021. Uh, in the article, Electroclinical Features in Epileptic Children with Chromosome 15Q Duplication Syndrome. Thank you very much, and thank you for your attention. And I would like to give special thanks to my colleagues at Necker Enfant Malade Hospital in Paris, and particularly in the Clinical Neurophysiology Department, in the genetics department and in the pediatric neurology department. Thank you very much.
Vidya, if you'd like to present at this point, feel free. Oh, great. Okay, I wasn't able to unmute earlier um, for some reason. Okay, awesome. Let me share my screen. Great. Um, are you all able to hopefully see my screen um, and hear me well? Okay, I'm just going to start. We are. Thank you so much. Awesome, great. Um, so hey everyone, um, thank you so much again um, for inviting me to present. So my research focuses um, on understanding um, the mechanisms um, that drive abnormal sleep in neurodevelopmental disorders. Sleep problems are highly prevalent in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders. And we have learned from many studies that poor sleep is associated with greater symptom severity, behavioral challenges, as well as cognitive impairment. Um, so for today's talk, I'm going to um, focus on abnormal sleep EEG patterns that we have identified um, in children with 15Q syndrome, which is um, some of the work that I did with Dr. Shafali Juste, um, who you all heard earlier, um, and really in partnership uh, with the 15Q Alliance. Um, I will not go over um, this background as we just heard about the genetics of Duke-15Q syndrome um, and the clinical features, but I really want to just highlight that, you know, in this um, 15Q duplicated region, there are several genes that are really important um, for early brain development and core developmental functions, such as synaptic function and formation. Um, and this includes the UB3A and the GABA receptor genes, um, which are specifically um, relevant for this work. And interestingly, um, as we also briefly heard about this before, um, in clinical EEGs from individuals with 15 q syndrome, during wakefulness, there are these abnormal EEG patterns um, that were first reported with the presence of these fast brain oscillations or high frequency beta oscillations as shown in this few second EEG trace here. And when we quantified these EEG recordings, we found that these increased beta oscillations really distinguish individuals with 15 q syndrome. And as you can see in this plot, the orange lines here represent children with Duke-15Q syndrome. And you can see this increase in beta power, which is between the 12 and 30 Hertz frequency range, but they're not seen in typically developing children or in the non-syndromic ASD group. And this was really interesting and exciting um, to us because typically we see an increase in beta oscillations when patients take certain anti-epileptic medications like benzodiazepines that modulate GABA receptors. And we have GABA receptor genes in the duplicated 15Q region, which really suggests that this unique EEG pattern may reflect the underlying genetic changes we see in this condition and can serve as a biomarker. So what is a biomarker? Um, a biomarker simply is um, an objective indicator of really the presence or absence of a disease state. Uh, biomarkers can serve as intermediate phenotypes that really link genes with behavior and can relate directly to the underlying disease mechanisms. They can help with drug target engagement and also tra um, tracking treatment response. For example, if we have um, a good brain-based biomarker that changes with treatment and we see changes in this marker you know, after giving the drug, then it's evident that there is successful target engagement. Um, and this can be seen even before we see changes in behavior. So this EEG pattern that we see in Duke-15Q syndrome can really serve as a biomarker that may reflect altered GABAergic neurotransmission. So in order to be able to use this marker in clinical trials, we then started investigating what this biomarker really reflects um, and how this biomarker behaves or changes um, in the clinical population. So we partnered with the Duke-15Q Alliance. Um, these are actually pictures from our 2017 family conference. Um, that happened here in LA in Redondo Beach. Um, and we brought our whole EEG data collection set up from our lab. Um, we set it up in one of the hotel rooms in Redondo. And we recorded a wake resting state EEG while children just watched bouncing bubbles on the screen. And in a second room, we had clinical psychologists conducting behavioral assessments. And just across three days, we collected EEG recordings from over 40 participants. And from this study, 
we found that this EEG biomarker that we see in Duke 15 q syndrome did not change with duplication type or based on the presence or absence of epilepsy. And we also found that this is highly reproducible across different EEG setups. So we are able to quantify this biomarker from both high density, like 128 channel um, research EEG, as well as these um, traditional low density 21 channel clinical EEG recordings. And we also found that this biomarker is highly stable over time. So all these findings really demonstrated that this EEG biomarker really um, you know, likely is a readout of the fundamental disease pathology in this condition, which remains unchanged over development. So we then wanted to determine if this increased beta oscillations we see in, during wakefulness modulated with brain state. So did they persist in sleep? Um, you know, if beta oscillations that we see in this condition truly reflect this disrupted GABAergic neurotransmission, then not only would we expect beta oscillations to persist in sleep, but also we would expect to see abnormal sleep rhythms because healthy sleep rhythms are highly dependent on GABAergic neurotransmission. So we quantified beta power in sleep, um, as well as features of sleep physiology, including spindles and slow wave sleep, and compared these measures um, with controls. But before going into the findings, I would like to give um, a really quick overview of um, what is happening um, you know, during sleep. So sleep is a time of very active neural activity and processing of information. Over the course of a typical night, we go through these um, different sleep stages sequentially. So from wakefulness, um, we go into these three stages of non-REM sleep. And after stage three, which is slow wave sleep, we transition into REM sleep. We cycle between REM and slow wave sleep about four to six times in a typical eight hour night. And these different sleep stages are defined by distinct EEG patterns and they, they, they really support important functions of the brain. For example, stage two of non-REM sleep, although transient, we now know is really critical because sleep spindles, which are sudden bursts of neural activity generated by the thalamic reticular nucleus um, deep in the brain, occurs during this stage, and these are really important for integrating new information and memory consolidation. And also, stage three of non-REM sleep, which is slow wave sleep or deep sleep, has been found to be a crucial time for reorganization of wake-related synapses. Um, so this stage contributes to the transfer of memory information from the hippocampus to the neocortex in the brain. Um, we also see vertex waves in stage one and theta waves in REM, um, which is all important for depotentiation or weakening of old connections and strengthening new connections um, in the brain circuitry. And it's been found that across species, spindles are time locked to specific phases of these slow wave oscillations. And this temporal coordination between all these sleep rhythms is really important for brain communication, plasticity, long-term memory consolidation. So you can imagine that you know, any disruptions to these um, brain rhythms can be detrimental. And because these brain activity patterns depend on um, this underlying molecular and cellular events, including synapse formation and function, when brain development is disrupted, as in the case of neurodevelopmental disorders, it changes how these sleep patterns develop. So in fact, um, you know, compared to the general population, sleep problems are highly prevalent in children with neurodevelopmental disorders. And there's been many studies that showed um, changes in sleep physiology in many of these children. So in order to understand the consequences and effects of sleep disturbances and how we can really treat them, it's really important to be able to analyze and quantify these um, different sleep features. And because it's not easy to just have families come to the lab and collect overnight sleep EG recordings, we decided to leverage clinical sleep EG recordings that were already collected at the UCLA clinics. Um, and also with the help of the Duke 15 q Alliance, we have been doing several Facebook Live videos through which we've been encouraging families to get a copy of their child's sleep EG, you know, if they ever had an overnight EG recording done, um, and then submit it to us. This is an ongoing study and we're still actually collecting data. And I really want to appreciate all the families that took the time to um, you know, send us their sleep EEG files. This work would not be possible without all of your help. Um, so thank you. So, um, so what did we really find you know, from these sleep EEG recordings? We found that children with Duke 15 q syndrome do transition through these different sleep stages. So they show evidence of vertex waves um, in stage one, K-complexes and spindles in stage two, and slow wave sleep in stage three of non rem But we really wanted to also quantify these features to see if there were differences between um, you know, children with Duke 15 q syndrome and our control group. 
So here is a time frequency plot derived from seven hours of overnight sleep EEG from a representative um, controlled participant. And you can see changes in frequency over the course of the night. And you can see these um, beautiful distinct epochs of time when there is increase in slow oscillations, um, you know, that's in red here, which is higher power, which um, really reflects the time they spend in deep sleep stage, um, which is what you would expect in healthy sleep. And in an age matched Duke 15 Q syndrome participant, you can tell right away that there are all these bursts of activity in the beta frequency range. And when we quantified, we found that beta power was significantly higher in Duke 15 Q syndrome. And this was seen across the scalp, um, seen in all channels, and it's seen regardless of um, epilepsy status. So we see this in individuals across the condition. Um, and what is also um, what was also really striking was we found that non-REM sleep rhythms are also altered in Duke 15 Q syndrome. So spindle density was significantly lower compared to our age match neurotypical control group. Um, and children with Duke 15 Q syndrome also spend significantly less amount of time in the slow wave sleep stage compared um, with healthy controls. And in fact, we found that several of our Duke 15 Q syndrome participants did not actually achieve slow wave sleep. Um, which is really striking. So this, in this, if you just consider on this bar graphs here, the darker color represents the amount of time um, that these participants spent in um, this low wave sleep stage. And you can see that in Duke 15 Q syndrome, this um, total amount of time is much less compared to the neurotypical controls. And you see that at a group level as well. All right, so based on all these findings, what may be happening in Duke 15 Q syndrome? Um, duplications in the 15Q critical region leads to overexpression in genes um, in the 15Q region, which are really critical for early brain development. And these changes may result in disruptions in GABA neurotransmission, resulting in increased beta oscillations that we see during wakefulness. But GABA neurotransmission is also really important for non-room sleep circuit function, which may be altered in this condition, resulting in abnormal spindles um, and abnormal slow wave sleep, as well as these persistent beta oscillations in sleep. These abnormal sleep rhythms in turn mean that, you know, the temporal coordination um, that I talked about earlier between these cortical slow wave oscillations, thalamocortical spindles, and hippocampal rhythms um, will, you know, which have been shown to be really key for brain plasticity and long-term memory consolidation may be altered in Duke 15 q syndrome, resulting in consequences to cognition and overall development. Um, and because we have limited time, I'm actually not showing it here, but one of our ongoing studies is really aimed at understanding um, the association between these changes in sleep physiology and um, clinical as well as behavioral measures that we see in the Q syndrome. So overall, these EEG markers of sleep disruption we see in the Q syndrome all point towards GABAergic dysfunction. And these are biomarkers that have the potential to serve as measures of drug target engagement or as proximal outcome measures that precede behavioral responses to treatment. And I want to conclude by saying that we are um, in this really exciting era of precision health in neurodevelopmental disorders where we have therapeutics that are being developed and there's so much potential for targeted treatments. Um, EEG is a great tool to measure brain function and helps in developing these biomarkers that I really think are critical in accelerating development of therapeutics um, and in designing clinical trials. And importantly, because I want to really highlight this, that this study was only possible because of the fact that we partnered with the Duke 15Q Alliance. So this work has showed that through partnerships with patient advocacy groups um, and using scalable testing methods, we can effectively test these biomarkers and really be ready to use them in clinical trials. And lastly, there's been so much work that's been done focusing on oscillatory changes in EEG during wakefulness, but we are uncovering this whole new domain of abnormal sleep physiology in rare genetic disorders. Sleep problems are you know, a real burden in the lives of many children with um, these disorders, with about 50 to almost 95% of children with these disorders having um, some kind of sleep issues. This really decreases the quality of life for these children and also negatively impacts caregivers and families. So really investigating um, changes in sleep physiology and understanding the relation between altered sleep circuits and cognition may shed light on the ideology of um, cognitive development and the sleep EEG markers could then serve as circuit endpoints in clinical trials. Um, with that, I wanna give a big thank you to 
all the wonderful Duke 15 Chief families that have been so engaged in our research. Um, this work would not be possible without all your help. Um, and I want to thank all our collaborators um, and funding sources, especially the Duke 15 Q Alliance, um, which funded a lot of this work um, as part of my PhD work, actually, with Dr. Shafali Jaste. Um, and I want to thank everyone at the Jaste Lab. And I am happy to answer any questions if you can post them on the chat. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, there are actually no questions. Um, so we're really grateful, but we'll definitely get back to you guys um, if we hear more in the audience. Our 